pot fishery, the non-spot shrimp pot fishery, and then a uh, shrimp trawl fishery. Um, as the, uh, Jason also said, I'm relatively new to Washington and I'm in, enjoying uh, every opportunity to learn more about the, the fisheries that I manage and uh, the users uh, that depend on them. Uh, with that, uh, this discussion today, we'll uh, dive into a couple of different topics. Uh, the first will be crab management in Puget Sound. We'll go over some of the management principles related to the Dungeness crab and red rock crab uh, recreational fisheries. Talk about the harvest groups that are out there and the allocation uh, requirements and, and principles uh, that fisheries operate on for both the recreational and commercial fisheries. Um, and then talk about the timing of those harvests. Um, my colleague Don will then go over some of the or go over the recreational rules um, for uh, the Dungeness and Red Rock fisheries. Um, talk about uh, some best practices for maximizing your catch and minimizing loss, and um, many of the the different intricacies of participating in this this fishing opportunity in Puget Sound. Uh, here are the two species that we'll be talking about today. The first is Dungeness crab, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, its uh, Latin name is Metacarcinus magister or, or Cancer magister, depending on who you ask. Uh, and then the other species is Red Rock crab or Cancer productus. In Puget Sound, um, there are two state fisheries uh, that are managed for, for uh, Dungeness crab. These are the recreational fishery um, and the commercial fishery. Uh, there is a tribal fishery out there as well, but that is not managed by uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, to participate in the recreational fishery for Dungeness crab, it does require a recreational crab, uh, Puget Sound Dungeness crab endorsement. Um, typically, you know, around 200,000 or more endorsements are sold per year. Uh, the catch reporting for this fishery is required via this catch record card, which is in, a, in addition to um, a shellfish license. Um, there is a separate CRC for each season. Uh, the, the Puget Sound Crab endorsement um, comes with one CRC per season. Separate additional CRCs will cost uh, an additional fee and Don will talk about that a little bit more. Um, there are two separate seasons for the recreational crab fishery. Um, these are the summer and the winter crab seasons. Summer um, can start as early as July 1, and for most areas ends uh, sometime around Labor Day. Uh, the winter crab season, where areas where there is enough catch, uh, starts October 1 uh, and will end uh, December 31st. For the, commercial, for the state commercial Dungeness crab fishery, uh, it is a limited entry fishery, meaning there are a fixed amount of licenses and participants that can uh, take part in this fishery. Uh, for Puget Sound, there are 249 state commercial Dungeness crab licenses. Um, there is the ability to stack a number of licenses per boat, uh, three licenses per boat. So that works out, um, you know, based on the, the current breakdown to be 132 different license owners uh, with a number of those, those licenses stacked on the same boat. Uh, per license, there is a 100 pot uh, limit and there's a maximum of three licenses per boat. In any given year, uh, over the last 15 years, um, the, the state commercial uh, licensees have never been permitted to use their 100 pot uh, limit. Uh, typically, depending on the, the area, it uh, is between 25 and, and 50 on, on the higher end. Um, and that's, that's uh, coordinated with uh, the, the fishery for them to be able to, you know, extend out some of the catch and not have it hit the market all at once. For the commercial fishery, all landings have to be recorded on, um, on a receipt known as a, a fish ticket, um, and that details where crab was caught, uh, weight, the price, uh, the taxes that they're paying on those, um, as well as who was fishing, how long they were fishing for, things like that. Um, and then 
uh, the season for this fishery runs from October 1 through April 15th every year. Uh, in Puget Sound, um, crab fisheries are split into different regions to manage and track harvest. And because of, of the co-management requirements that we have um, with the treaty tribes in Puget Sound. So there are eight different management regions. Um, region three, as indicated on this, this graph here is, or on this map on the right, has been subdivided uh, out into multiple regions. For regions one, two east, two west, and three. Um, these regions have both commercial and recreational fisheries that happen on the state side. Uh, for regions four, five, six, and seven, uh, the state reserves uh, its share of crab in those areas uh, for recreational harvest only. Um, and that, that breakdown is, is roughly, you know, the Strait, San Juan Islands, and Central Sound uh, have some level of commercial effort, uh, but the, the Puget Sound proper and Hood Canal do not. Um, the recreational, these, these designations are separate from the, the marine area designation, um, but mostly, those mostly align with the structure. And there's a, a table here that lets you translate what the marine area is relative to these, uh, these crab regions. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the, the recreational marine over areas uh, are a, a holdover from salmon management. So they don't exactly line up with our, our uh, <laughs> crab management areas. Uh, this is also uh, a, a series of, of maps just to show those different areas. So. Um, what we call two east and two west uh, are eight one eight two uh, nine and part of twelve right here. Uh, region one translates to region seven. Uh, three is roughly the strait, so it's four five six in the marine area speak. Uh, for the state harvest trends. Um, the state fisheries in Puget Sound uh, have kind of differed in their structure and policies that have guided them over time. In this graph, you can see um, the, the management season on the x-axis, so 1993 would be the 1993-1994 season, um, stretching from the 1993 all the way to this most recent season, the 2020-2021 season. Um, on the Y, you can see the, the millions of pounds that are harvested by each of those different sectors. Uh, in 2010, uh, there was a change in WDFW commission policy, which created a recreational priority for uh, Dungeness crab in Puget Sound. Um, and you saw prior to 2011, when that policy was enacted, uh, you know, a pretty wide gap between the amount that was harvested by the state commercial fleet in blue and the recreational fleet in gray. And then after that policy, up until about 2015 or 16, um, that those relative catches between the state recreational and state commercial, um, uh, the, the gap narrowed between them. Uh, in 17 and 18, in 2017 and 18, there were a series of, of uh, conservation closures in marine areas 11, 13, and um, part of Hood Canal, uh, which removed some of the, the recreational the opportunity and easy to access areas, uh, which then kind of widened that gulf between the recreational harvest in gray and commercial harvest in blue. Few minute warning over there, Daniel. Thanks. Uh, so for the, in terms of who's going to be at, on the water in any given time, um, a management plan year for crabs stretches from May of one year to April of the second year. Um, at any given time, there may be a, a tribal fishery on, on the water and active somewhere in Puget Sound. Uh, that doesn't mean everywhere all at once, and it doesn't mean that they're not following, you know, the same constraints that we do with regard to soft shell crab or size limits. It, it just means that they have the flexibility to be able to fish uh, in a broader uh, array of timeframes than we do. 
due to WDFW policy, um, uh, commission policy, the state recreational fishery can only fish between July 1 uh, and uh, Labor Day. Uh, and the winter recreational season can happen from October 1 uh, through uh, December 31st. Uh, and then the state commercial fishery can only happen between October 1st and April 15th of the, the following year. What this means is that uh, the recreational fleet has a, a uh, priority access to the resource. They can harvest uh, first and that the state commercial fishery goes after them uh, and harvests uh, the remaining share uh, that was not harvested by the recreational fleet. Um, in addition to those you know, month by month timeframes, uh, the recreational fishery also uh, is limited in the days of the week that they can fish. Uh, the policy dictates um, that Tuesday and Wednesdays will be uh, closed to allow for recovery of, of derelict gear. Um, and to give uh, opportunity for other fisheries that, that don't put gear in the water a chance to uh, happen. The uh, state share or the, the share, the quota of, of Dungeness crab in Puget Sound um, is allocated to various user groups uh, through, uh, you know, a quota system. So, of all the crab that are available to harvest um, and that are agreed to by co-management agreement, the state receives 50% of that. The tribes receive 50% of that. Uh, and this is the result of uh, a federal court order which uh, reaffirmed the Puget Sound Treaty tribes uh, right to harvest 50% um, of the shellfish resources in Puget Sound. Of that 50% of the share that uh, becomes the state's entire share, the harvest, uh, it is split up between the state recreational and commercial uh, with the WDFW commission crab policy giving the recreational fleet harvest priority over state commercial. So in any given year, there's the possibility of the state recreational harvesting every crab. That's never happened uh, more often in line uh, it is, you know, 50 to 60 to percent of the harvest going to the, the state commercial fleet. So the Dungeness crab fishery is managed using what's called the 3S management framework. The three S's are size, sex, and season. Um, for Dungeness crab, there is a minimum legal size of harvested crab um, that is six and one quarter inches. This provides between uh, two to three years for males to reproduce before entering the fishery, uh, being meaning getting large enough to harvest. Um, we do have a sex component for this management framework and uh, with Dungeness crab, only male crab can be legally retained. This allows females the opportunity to reproduce and use your pots and, and feed off of them without harvest pressure. Uh, there, is also a season component. The seasons are designed to uh, limit the interaction with soft shell crab or when uh, crab are molting. Um, this reduces the crab that die when they're getting sloshed around in a pot or um, being predated on when they get caught in a pot and, and turn soft. Um, crab are moderately cannibalistic, so that is a a pretty real concern. Um, it also maximizes the quality and the value of that resource to our, our different user groups. Um, we, want, we want to provide access to this resource for people to harvest it and for it to, to enter the market. Um, it is a, a resource that's held in the public trust and, and we do manage it to that end. Um, so all, all of the seasons that I've described, even the tribal ones, are set around crab molt periods. Um, that's to avoid soft shell crab. With respect to that size limit, um, the size does depend on the area that you're harvesting. Within all of Puget Sound, for all fisheries, every crab that is legally caught must be larger uh, must be at least six and one quarter inches wide. Um, and that size is measured 
uh, just interior of those two outermost teeth or spines um, and does not include them. Um, measurement for uh, measuring uh, the size of a crab, we recommend using a gauge or something that is rigid uh, and shows uh, the actual slot that uh, uh, the actual slot of the size rather than trying to fit a dollar bill or a ruler or a tape measure uh, to the crab because those things uh, either can be difficult to read or they can wrap around the shell of a crab and not measure the, the true size. Here's a, another image showing how to, to measure a crab. Notice that the, uh, the prongs of that, that gauge are uh, just inside those spines uh, and that that crab with that six and one quarter inch mark um, is large enough to be harvested. Uh, for sex, male crab can be harvested and female crab cannot. Um, to distinguish between male and female crab, um, the abdominal flap of a male uh, is, is uh, long and skinny or tall and narrow. Um, it looks like a, a lighthouse or a tower or a pinnacle. Uh, for a female crab, that abdominal flap takes up uh, a much larger portion of the underside of the abdomen. Uh, and it is not long and skinny, it is wider. Um, and that is how we uh, sex uh, Dungeness crab. For the season structure, as I noted, the seasons are planned to avoid the molting period for um, Dungeness crab. Uh, unlike you or I, when crab grow, they molt or their uh, hard parts of their shell. Um, so they'll shed their exoskeleton. Uh, mm -hmm and all of the hard parts completely and step out of it, leaving their former shell behind them, um, as well as their gills. Uh, that new shell that they have, which is of like a parchment-like consistency, slightly leathery, um, but very soft, uh, is then pumped up with water. They fill it up like a, like a balloon. Uh, and then the shell hardens around that new size. Uh, around the water that they've been pumped into their shell. Um, and then as that crab then grows, it displaces that water with muscle tissue. Um, and and that, that growth pattern is, is uh, very typical of crustaceans. Uh, for a recently molted soft shell crab, uh, it will not have grown into their new shell. So it, it might be a, a legal size, but the soft shell crab will have relatively low meat yield per crab. The quality of that meat is poor um, and uh, it is more likely to die from handling, more likely to drop legs or claws uh, or uh, just get bounced around within that shell. The molting process is a very uh, biologically uh, rigorous process for them to go to and there's some level of, of loss even just associated with a molt that doesn't happen from uh, handling. To check for a, a soft shell crab, there's a few things you can look at. You can look for a, a clean carapace that's, that's free of barnacles. Uh, that means that the, the crab does not have any barnacles or epifauna or, or things on it. Um, it will look cleaner uh, or brighter or shinier um, than a hard shell crab. Um, the hairs on the underside of the carapace um, on the, the shell in between the claw and the, the carapace are blonde um, and very bright. Um, when you pick up a soft shell crab, it will seem light in its weight for its size. Um, and then the underside, um, instead of being kind of a cream color, it might be more beige. Uh, you can also squeeze the underside of the carapace uh, or uh, the legs uh, to test for soft shell crab. Um, if the underside of the carapace uh, in between the, the claw and the, the leg there uh, has any give, sounds like a peanut or styrofoam or a Snapple pop top, um, then that's a soft shell crab um, and it, it can't be retained. 
Additionally, if you press on the walking leg segment um, of the foremost walking leg uh, in the middle, um, if that is soft and the, the membranes where those joints articulate balloon, so you see them distend, that's also an indication that that crab is soft. Hey, uh, Daniel, could this be a good stopping point? We need to move on here pretty soon. Yeah, I think that was... Uh, yeah. We can kick it to Don now. Okay, um, well, we got... Uh, if you could uh, turn your video on real quick, I do have a couple questions that I like, and they've... They have asked to see the faces of the people that are talking to them. And I think at least for the Q&A part, that would, that would be nice to have, to have that, if you don't mind. Yep. There we go. Okay. Um, and also a reminder to everybody, I saw a couple people hitting the raise hand button. I know people have come on a little bit late. Um, we are only using that Q&A tab. So any questions that you may have, uh, please just use the, uh, the Q&A tab and we'll answer your questions from there. Um, so the first question for you was that I've heard, uh, kind of unrelated to this, but something people ask about a lot is I've heard that metal rebar can create small electric current in reaction with seawater. Is this a deterrent for crabs entering the trap? Um, and real quick before you answer that for other people who are listening and may not understand that question is a lot of people will put rebar in their pots to add weight to it. And then Don will talk about weight in your pots later. So that's why people are asking about the rebar. Yeah, uh, that's a, a really good question. I'm not sure that Don or I really have a, a good answer for it. Um, it's something that commercial crabbers on the, the coast have approached me with just relative to certain um, pot styles. They, they believe that, you know, the, the metal and the flow of water around that metal creates an electromagnetic field, which might um, enhance or decrease catch depending on, on who you talk to. Um, so it's not, it's not a concept that's foreign to us. It's just not something that that we've we've tested in terms of ways to weight down your crab uh, your pots um rebar is really commonly used uh but if, if you're worried about that there are alternatives you know using uh cement cylinders or something like that although uh for nearly everyone you're already using a metal crab pot um either in the mesh or in the the framing of it uh, so that effect remains regardless of whether you put rebar in there or not. And uh, another good question that's, uh, that's a good um, reminder for everybody was, even with the recreational license, are we required to fill out catch record cards? I'll let Don take that one. Uh, yeah, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, so you're required to fill out a catch record card for Dungeness crab only in Puget Sound. Uh, so if you're targeting red rock crab only, which most people are not, uh, but if you happen to be, you would not need a, a Puget Sound crab endorsement, Dungeness crab endorsement, and you would not need a catch record card. In fact, we need to remind people that if you are catching red rock crab, they do not go on a catch record card. Excellent. Thanks, Don. Okay, um, so we're ready to move on uh, with Don talking about the regulations and seasons. And let me give him a quick introduction here. Um, so Don holds a degree from Oregon State University and University of Washington. His graduate work involved optimizing aquaculture conditions for juvenile gooey duck clams. And he has worked with the Department of Fish and Wildlife since 1993. His early work at Fish and Wildlife was with intertidal clam and oyster enhancement. And since 95, he has been working primarily with the crab and shrimp fisheries in Puget Sound. And you are good to go, Don. Great. Uh, I will let Daniel control the, uh, the presentation and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the group at the workshop. Um, I, am, I am the uh, recreational crab and shrimp fishery manager within Puget Sound uh, uh, underneath Caitlin Bosley, who's the crab and shrimp lead in Puget Sound. Uh, so this slide uh, to start is the uh, depicts the summer recreational crab season dates for 2021. And this came out in a news release uh, earlier in June. Uh, I believe it was around June 10th. Uh, as you can see, a lot of Puget Sound, and these are listed by marine areas on the left, uh, will be opening on July 1 this year. That's tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, the summer season will last through September 6th. And it'll be on a Thursday through Monday schedule. And as Daniel indicated, uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays during the summer season are closed. Uh, 
further north in Marine Area 7, we have it divided into 7 south and 7 north. Those areas will begin uh, later on in the summer because of molt patterns in those areas. Um, 7 south, which includes the San Juan Islands and Bellingham, July 15th through September 30th. Again, Thursday through Monday only each week. 7 north, uh, even later, August 19th through September 30th. Thursday through Monday each week. Um, marine areas 10 and 11 this year, we have uh, very low uh, state targets for harvest. And as a result, uh, we have re reduced seasons in marine areas 10 and 11, that's Seattle, Bremerton, Tacoma, Vashon. Uh, in area 10, we're opening July 11th through September 6th only, uh, on only two days a week, Sundays and Mondays. It's uh, it's a departure from what we normally do. And Marine Area 11, similarly, July 11th through August 30th, even smaller window, Sundays and Mondays only. Uh, uh, Hood Canal, and that's Marine Area 12 south of Aoc Point. That's the very southern portion of the canal. And Marine Area 13 are closed to promote Dungeness crab recovery. Test fishing in these areas uh, uh, has been very poor. And by agreement, state and tribal fisheries are closed in these areas. And next slide. Again, this is a reminder of where those uh, marine areas are in Puget Sound. Um, and the reminder for marine areas 10, 12, 11, and 13, those, those ones in southern Puget Sound, those are strictly recreational crab fishery only. There are no state commercial fisheries in those areas. Some of the recreational rules for Dungeness crab, uh, as Daniel mentioned, males only, a six and a quarter inch in Puget Sound, uh, minimum size limit. A uh, frequent question we get is, uh, why do you have to retain the back shells? Well, uh, you need to retain the back shells while in the field to be able to prove compliance with the minimum size limit. There's a daily limit of five Dungeness crab. Soft shell crab must be released. Daniel described uh, uh, some of the characteristics of soft shell crab. There is a requirement for a bi biodegradable device or escape cord on, on every shellfish pot. Um, uh, this, this escape cord or biodegradable device will uh, allow the pot to fail and release the crab if the pot is lost for whatever reason. Uh, crab pots must have a minimum mesh size of one and a half inches. Uh, that's to uh, eliminate the unnecessary handling and capture of other species in, in the trap. Pots must have two four and a quarter inch escape rings in the upper half of the pot. The function of these escape rings is to allow most of the uh, juvenile uh, male and female crab that, to come and go basically. And they'll utilize the pot as a feeding station and the pot will select for largely the uh, legal size males only. Uh, a reminder, keeping claws only for any of our crabs, Dungeon Nester Red Rock uh, is illegal. And uh, they do have a fishery uh, on the East Coast, stone crab that does allow keeping claws only, but that's different species in different area. It's not legal here. And part of the rationale with that uh, is we can't tell the size of a crab where you've kept only the claws. And for red rock crab, uh, they'll be when uh, they're at a size where you're going to want to keep the claws, uh, they likely won't have many molts left in their life cycle. Uh, and they grow their claws back over subsequent molts. So by taking even a single claw or, or both claws, uh, it's unlikely that that crab, crab will grow them back, which I think is what people are, are intending when they're, they're doing that. Yes, exactly. And, and one other note is, you know, it's, it, it seems to be a problem with red rock crab more than Dungeness crab and Puget Sound because Dungeness crab have a lot of meat in the body, uh, accessible meat in the body, whereas red rock don't. So it's particularly a problem with red rock crab. Yeah. Um, and those crab may die by you removing their claw. Correct. Uh, yeah. They will bleed out. There's some mortality there. 
Uh, red rock crab, the rules for that, males or females are allowed to be re retained as uh, har in recreational harvests. Uh, there's a five inch minimum size limit. That size is measured similar to Dungeness crab in immediately in front of those outermost points or the 10th points on the shell. Again, back shells must be retained while in the field to prove compliance. There's daily limit of six. And similar to dungeon nests, you have to release the soft shell. You have to have the biodegradable device. And the requirements for the pots are the same. And again, a reminder, keeping claws only is illegal with this species. And it's, it's the one that we have the problem with, to be honest, in Puget Sound. Next slide. Uh, for Dungeness crab, you must have a shellfish license or a combination license. You must have a Dungeness crab endorsement and catch record card to keep Dungeness crab in Puget Sound. You are required to record your each crab that you keep immediately on your catch record card. And this is something that salmon fishermen have, have grown to uh, understand and be compliant with. Uh, it's been a little bit more of a struggle. Uh, to translate that to the crabbing community, uh, but uh, this is the this is the rule. You are required to record each crab you keep immediately, and that's before you set your pot again uh, to harvest more crab. Um, you are required to report your catch from your summer and winter CRCs by the deadlines that are shown on each of those cards. Um, you'll you have two options for reporting. You can mail your catch report in or you can actually log in on, onto our website and report your catch online. Uh, buoys are required for all unattended gear in the recreational fishery and they have to be half red and half white. Um, uh, buoys must have your full name and the address of the person fishing the trap. Uh, uh, phone numbers are optional. Some people put phone numbers on, on their buoys, which is great, uh, but the, the law requirement is full name and address. Uh, putting your boat name or just your initials and area code, uh, that, that doesn't work. None of that is legal. Uh, buoy lines must not float on the surface. For that reason, we recommend people uh, use leaded line or sinking crab line. Uh, as opposed to polypropylene yellow lines which float on the surface. Uh, you could try and weight those yellow lines or floating lines, but it's awfully very difficult and uh, problematic. And we have lots of problems with those getting tangled in uh, propellers in Puget Sound. And there's only two units of gear allowed per person each day. So if you have a license and you're going after crab, uh, you can use one ring net, one pot, you, know, you can use a combination of a ring net, pot, and or castable snare. All those are considered units of gear, but you're only allowed two of those per person. Uh, red rock crab, similarly, you have to have a shellfish license or combination license, but you don't need the crab endorsement. You will not have to have a catch record card. You're not required to record red rock crab, and you're not required to report the catch, but everything else, uh, in terms of the gear is similar to Dungeness crab. Next With respect one. to Dungeness crab, um, you have to report all of your catch, even if that catch is zero for the season. So if you just get a, a crab endorsement and you end up not catching anything or going, um, the, the letter of the law is that that CRC still needs to be recorded, either online or by mail. And, and that was a, what Daniel points out is as was a particular problem this past season. The summer fishery in 2020, 15% <clears throat> fewer of the CRCs were reported uh, as required. And when you fail to report your catch record card information, not only are catch estimates impacted, but uh, you also receive a $10 administrative penalty when you buy your license for the next season. So. Uh, that's an important point, um, and and even if you catch no Dungeness crab, you need to report that either by mailing in your card or reporting online. Uh, interestingly, people often ask, well, how often do you get uh, reports of 
people who've gone out on a trip and caught no crab. Well, if you think about it, you're not required to record any any trips where you caught no kept no crab, basically. Uh, in fact, you're, it would only use one of the 20 lines on your catch record card and make you uh, purchase another catch record card more quickly. So uh, you're, you're only required to record on your CRC when you keep a Dunstan's crab. But you're required to report your catch whether you kept any crab for that season, that CRC period or not. And then with respect to any crab gear in, in Puget Sound, while the, the lines must not float on the surface, all attempts must be made for the buoy to float at the surface. Uh, there's been uh, recently uh, a lot of interest in using time release devices to keep those buoys down so people can recover their gear at a later time and avoid it being um, handled by others. Uh, however, that is uh, illegal. Um, using a, a zinc to tie the buoy to the pot and let it pop up later uh, makes it so that we can't keep track of the number of pots that you're doing. It also greatly increases the likelihood that your gear will be lost uh, and it uh, makes it much more likely that you won't get your gear back. Yes, and those time release devices that Daniel talk, is talking about are things like zinc links, um, you know, and, and things like that. Uh, one other note is uh, when you are fishing uh, crab pots, either commercially or recreationally, your buoys must be uh, on the surface at all, uh, at all tide heights uh, as much as possible and your pots should never be high and dry. And that has become, that has been a problem in some areas like Dungeness Bay. Uh, when pots are high and dry, of course, the crabs have a low survival rate. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is an example of the catch record card. Uh, so you have to have your uh, endorsement and your catch record card. Uh, when uh, you go on a trip and you keep Dungeness Crab, you have to use one of those empty lines on the card. Uh, you have to record your crab immediately, up to five per day per CRC holder. And the information required is in date, marine area, and number of crab. And if you record catch from uh, two marine areas on the same date, you have to do it on separate lines on your catch record card. And again, uh, uh, each catch record card has a, a, a deadline for reporting your catch. And it gives you, it reminds you of the two options that you have on the right side of the slide. And, uh, and it also reminds you that of the penalty if you don't report your catch in a timely fashion. Two minutes, if we could wrap it up in a couple of minutes, Don. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, reporting requirements, we've talked about this already. The two options, mail in or internet, uh, the first question uh, when you're doing the internet is, did you retain crab? If it's no, it's very quick. If it's yes, then you submit all the lines of information from your card. And if you have problems uh, reporting your catch, or you know someone who ha has problems reporting the catch, uh, please contact us and one of us will help you or we'll refer you to Eric Craig in our CRC unit and they will assist you in getting that information entered. Next slide. Again, this is the, the point Daniel brought up and this is the slide I was going to uh, emphasize that is even if you did not catch any crab, as you can see in this slide, that, that's a fair number of the recreational harvesters, um, you must report your catch or you will see, receive a penalty. Um, and, um, and I can't emphasize that more, particularly after summer 2020 when we, we dropped from 51% of, of CRCs being reported to 36%. It was a real problem last year. Next slide. Uh, again, this is, illustrates some of the components and gear requirements. And, and I'll, I'll go over a lot of this on the video, Jason, so I won't spend too much time on this. But in the diagram, you'll see the, the requirements of traps. Uh, number one illustrates the properly labeled buoy. Number two, if you don't have sinking line, that, that floating line better be weighted. 
Uh, number three, those are the escape rings, two, four and a quarter inch required in the upper half of the pot. Uh, number four, the biodegradable device, uh, uh, natural fiber escape cord that will disappear right away and allow crab to escape if that pot is lost. Uh, number five is the minimum mesh size of one and a half inches. And importantly, number seven, the added weight for especially the light design pots uh, to keep them from traveling and being lost. The flags and staffs are optional. I'll go over that later in the video portion. Next slide. Some of the other things you don't want to forget, bring your rules pamphlet with you. It'll make your interaction with an enforcement officer a lot more pleasant if you have that with you. And it's even more pleasant if you've read it, the portion on crabbing. Uh, bring your license, a pen, and your catch record card. You need a crab caliper to measure uh, whether your crab are legal size. If you're going for red rock, be sure you have a five inch caliper. Don't forget to bring bait. Uh, that's, that's a real critical piece. Uh, some of the more common baits are mackerel, sardines, salmon, clams. Those are the ones that the commercial folks use because they're quite effective. Recreational folks also use chicken, turkey, herring because they can be available more commonly to the recreational public and they, uh, they also work. And don't forget to bring a container uh, for your catch. Uh, often it's best to keep your catch cool and under wet towels or burlap or, um, uh, and those, that method will keep crab alive more readily than putting them in a unaerated uh, bucket of water where they will quickly use up the oxygen and, and probably die before you get home. And next slide. Some tips to improve your catch. <clears throat> Add weight to the entry gates that swing uh, and that keeps them from opening in a strong current, that can help. Any trap styles with ramps at the entry tunnels tend to retain crab better than those without ramps and I can go over that in the video. Inspect your traps for holes and malfunctioning gates. It only takes one hole or one uh, gate not working to really reduce your catch. So it's, it's, it's worth a quick check. Use durable bait containers uh, for, your, for your fishing. Uh, you don't want them to take your bait away and yet you want the bait to uh, produce a scent and travel and draw the crab in. Check your escape cord. It really stinks when uh, you haven't changed that in a while and you forget and you throw a pot out and it rots in the time you're fishing. And attach bait to the bottom center of the trap. Force the crab to enter and feed. Don't tie it to the sides or in the corners. Be willing to try different depths. And uh, again, that's just a reminder of what the pros use for bait. Next slide. Uh, Daniel, do I have a lot more material in this section? 12 slides left on. 12, okay. Uh, our enforcement program does do on the water gear sweeps for anything that still has a buoy on the surface. These pictures show you a little bit of the effort involved in the volume of traps that we recover in Puget Sound. Next slide. Uh, this is some information from those summertime crab sweeps. Uh, what this displays is how many pots were recovered from 2018 through 2020 from WDFW's effort. And these are all uh, uh, buoys on the surface gear on closed days. Uh, the green represents uh, recreational traps where the owner was identifiable, meaning they marked their, their buoys uh, properly. The red indicates recreational owners not truly known because not all the information was there. Uh, the grays treaty commercial traps, very small portion very small state commercial and then unknown in blue. So you can see the, the vast majority of the recovered traps are recreational traps. Uh, when you look at the types of gear that are recovered, the vast majority, often 75% of the gear is square light folding traps. Uh, they also are called Danielson style, um, uh, commercial style round traps and the other styles of traps are a smaller portion of the recovered gear as shown in orange and in purple. Next slide. One thing that astonished me and, and others that I work with is how many of those recreational traps have the buoys attached incorrectly. Um, by, our, by our judgment, 73% of those have the buoys on incorrectly. 
and I will go over what the correct attachment of a buoy to a trap uh, is in the video portion of, of the training. Uh, unweighted traps, another su significant problem in the recovered gear from those closed days, 64% of those traps are unweighted. Uh, surprisingly, the use of floating line is not a huge problem. It's only 15% of the traps that we recovered on closed days uh, last year were floating line. Some of the things to maximize escapement from your lost traps, use the required escape cord, use smaller cord than what's required. Uh, thread size 120 is legal, but 60 is better. It's a smaller diameter and it rots more quickly. Uh, very effective methods for escape cord as described in the pamphlet are in, in, securing an entire side of those folding traps with three loops of cord or tying in your escape rings with escape cord. The least effective we found is escape cord on the top door that has a lip at the edge of the trap. The, the, the crab are unable to negotiate that and, and push the door up. Um, and that was work done uh, by the Northwest Straits Commission and Muckle Teal that helped determine that that wasn't wasn't an effective way to use escape cord. And and what Don means by escapement here is uh, the escape of crabs if your gear was to be lost. Yes, yes. That that escape cord is rots away and is designed to allow the crabs to escape. Now this this photograph shows the escape ring attachment method. And again, when that uh, cotton cord or natural fiber cord rots away, the escape rings fall us out in the crack and get out. And this shows that same, uh, that same event where the escape ring is dropped out of the upper corner and the crab is able to get out in that upper corner. And, and pots that were rigged this way, uh, uh, escape of the crabs was particularly effective once that, that rot cord uh, dissolved. This is the style of trap that is more problematic. When the escape cord rots, um, unless there's some kind of bungee or retrieval thing to lift that, that top door up, the crab really don't get out very well. And, and so often to make this style of trap more functional in terms of when the escape cord rots away, you need to add that bungee that's shown in the left hand portion to lift that door up. Questions? All right, yeah, we do have some good good questions. Thanks, Don. And just for our viewers out there, we're running a bit over, um, but please stay tuned. Don has a good uh, video instructional that he's gonna do for you here in just a moment, but we do got some questions that I wanna get to beforehand. And also I wanted to point out what Don was just talking about regarding how crab can escape and making it easy for them to escape. Um, if your pot bec does become lost, we have an instructional video on our website that I showed you earlier. If you go to Derelict, actually, in a couple of days, you can just go to catchmorecrab.org and it'll take you right to the right to the website that has an instructional video with Don showing that and a very easy modification you can do to really explain that really well. Yes. Um, so some, uh, some good questions we have here for you guys. First one is how long do we need to keep the back of the shells? Uh, I'll take that one. The it's the legal requirement is while in the field. Uh, and when you're in the field, that's other than your place of permanent residence. So this is an often asked question because a lot of people do not want to take the backs of the shells back to their permanent residence. They stink. It's a hot summer day. It attracts bees. But if you're going by letter of the law, that is the letter of the law. Uh, a lot of people take chances by tossing the shells back into the water at the boat ramps. But if you're going by letter of the law, and that's what I have to tell you, um, it's you have to keep them until you get home. Okay, thanks. Uh, next good question is how quickly will the escape cord biodegrade enough to release crab? And how long can the crab survive in the trap till this uh, degrade happens? That, that is a good question. Depending on the type of natural fiber you use, jute, sisal, most of those in the size, the diameters and gauges that you can buy in stores will degrade faster than cotton cord. 
most people who are using the cotton cord maximum size thread size 120 uh, it's going to take up to 14 15 weeks for that to degrade which is a long time uh, so for the sport casual recreational user and i think through all the crabber education display packets that we put out we uh, provide smaller gauge cotton fiber cord for escape cord because uh, it really it really is most effective in releasing the crab if your crab is lost because it, it will take a shorter time to rot than the 15 weeks yeah and kind of put it because they were asking like numbers of days for crab to two to kind of put that into perspective i know so there's been it's been two research projects in the puget sound region on how long it takes crab cord to uh rock cord to degrade and uh, for the 120 thread count, one of them, it came up with 105 days and the other one was 126 days. Um, so quite a while. And, um, and we also learned that it takes about 50 days for crab to start dying in those pots. Um, and so as Don says, we, you know, we recommend using a thinner rock cord. You know, if you get that 120 thread count in, their, in your marine supply store, you know, it's a couple strands. So you can pull the strands apart and you'll, not, you'll now have a thinner strand. Um, we're also here at the foundation, we're doing some research um, to better understand those impacts and and hopefully propose some regulation changes on the thickness of that. So perhaps some things coming up with that. Yeah, and I'll show people how you can take that three strand cord awesome. and separate it and use it in the video. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, and in, in terms of how long those those crab live, Jason just told us uh, 50 days, but remember that that pod isn't in a closed system once it's in the water. So it, that, there'll be a lot of variation around that. Um, they might only live a couple days because an octopus comes and cleans out the pot. Or they might live longer because fish keep coming into the pot or, or things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, however, lost gear uh, is particularly pernicious because it, it creates a, a cycle of, of creating its own bait. You know, a crab will die in there or other things will come in the pot and die. And that will re-up the attractant for, for that trap to bring other things in. So it's really important to... Uh, make sure that you have all your escape cords and bio uh, bio devices all uh, set up properly and well cared for. Yes. All right, that's uh, got a lot of good questions. Let me just let's do a couple more and then let's move on and then we'll try to get to these other ones. First one is uh, for buoys, in addition to the red and white buoys, can other color buoys be added to, differ to differentiate my buoys from the other sea of red and white buoys that are out there? Okay, I'll speak to that one. Letter of the law again. Uh, all, all buoys are supposed to be half red, half white. Now, if you want to distinguish your buoy, your, uh, buoy setup from all the <laughs> thousands of others that you're going to see out there, the staff and flag are what people are supposed to use to differentiate. And what I've seen people do, and I'll show this in the video as well, I'll show a staff and flag set up. You can use any type of flag, uh, any type of colored staff or color coding, colored tape on your staffs just to personalize and differentiate your buoy so that visually from a distance you can pick it out. Um, you're, not, so, you're, not, you're not supposed to use like blue buoys or pink buoys or anything like that in addition to your half red, half white. Uh, As an so additional... I'm sorry, because yeah, that's that's something that we apparently got it wrong. So, having your one red and white buoy, you cannot add another color buoy to that. Uh, I I can find the whack and I will okay. share it with you guys. But yeah, I believe for both the shrimp and crab fisheries, crab is half red, half white for shrimp, and I believe the words are all buoys. Hmm. Okay. And I know in practice, you see in the on the water it. You see people who aren't doing that, but I'm, I'm trying to prevent people from potentially getting tagged uh, by violating a rule. Okay. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to see that whack because I've changed some of the oh, stuff yeah. we've said. <laughs> as, a, as an addition to that, all of the buoys that you use um, have to be a durable material. It means they can't be a Tide jug or a milk gallon or, or anything like that and that is something that enforcement is is acting on those those non-buoy shaped non-durable materials they add a lot of drag to your pot you know they're, they're not tapered and they will catch a lot of stuff so you're more likely to lose your gear when you're using them um, and also they're 
they're pretty degradable uh, to and can potentially add more more refuse to the water, which I don't think anybody wants. They they leak and sink too. Uh, those hollow ones, the hollow you know the jugs that you're talking about. For all the reasons Daniel mentioned, they're illegal and they leak and sink, which could draw, you know, pull your whole thing under. Yeah. Okay, um, so we have we have other questions here, but in respect to everybody's time, so the, the folks whose questions we have not answered yet, um, we will try to get to those after Don's next presentation, because for the other people that are still on, I want to want to give them opportunity to see Don's presentation. We'll try to get to these other questions, but I will say, Don, one of the questions was, uh, can you share your preferred knot for tying the buoy rope to the trap? So I'm not, I'm not sure if you're showing that if you're demonstration, but if you're able to, that's, that was a question that could, could uh, relate yeah. to your, your presentation. Well, I can, I can describe the knot I would use. Usually if I want something to be snug, I'll tie a bowl in. And if I really want something to uh, stay put, I will wrap a couple wraps of electrical tape around it. So that, that's the answer. And I think the instructions for a bowl in are, are online everywhere. Okay. Um, uh, that, that's, that's what I would do. Um, and then I'll go into the, in the video, but you, you do want to make sure all your attachment points, whether it be a line to a ring or, or whatever are secure and, and durable so that you don't have a failure at any of the points all the way up to the buoy. Okay, great. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna spotlight your video, um, Don, so you can go ahead and start with your demonstration. All right, I'm gonna move my computer. All right. I think you need to stop sharing your screen, Daniel. Okay. I might hold some stuff up closer to the, the camera once I get there. Can everybody see, see the gear I have on the table? And I will lift it up. Yeah, I can see it, Don. Okay. So I'll start from the buoy end. This is a typical recreational setup. Again, the most common one is a folding square crab trap. This one is octagonal. It's another. Uh, often used one, uh, and you'll see it for sale in a lot of uh, the supply stores. So starting at the buoy end, uh, probably the most simple setup is the half red, half white buoy. This does not show the full name and address, but to, to be legal, it has to be on here and it has to be legible. Uh, a, a frequent problem we find uh, when we recover gear uh, on the fish and wildlife suites is it was probably legible at one time, but uh, it isn't any longer. So if you're putting your gear out, uh, just confirm that number one, you haven't moved since the last time <laughs> you went crabbing uh, and your current information is on there and make sure that it's legible, full name and address. Phone number is optional. Uh, but some folks do if they have multiple people using their gear and, and you know, instead of putting a new buoy on or erasing it and, and writing a, a new name on for the new people coming on their boat um, is bring a, you know, a stick of tape um, and put that with their information on it. Uh, and if you can secure that well enough, uh, it, it does work for those purposes. Yeah. And I've talked to enforcement and the, the white duct tape relabeling of the buoy. Uh, uh, they approve of that temporary method to, um, you know, if somebody is going to borrow your gear, for instance. Um, again, sinking crab line, uh, that's what sinking crab line looks like. It's steel gray, blue. Uh, I'll show it to people a little bit more closely. It looks like this. I'll try to hold it against my black background. Um, Often the floating line is yellow, uh, polypropylene. Uh, that, that is not the preferred line for crabbing in my book. Uh, so in this case, this is sinking line. There's a knot to prevent the buoy from traveling past that knot on the bottom. And then there's usually a knot on the top. Some people will put a loop at the top of their buoy setup. Uh, so because that way they can grab it easily from the side of a boat to retrieve their gear. This is the most important thing that I, I need to, to communicate to people 
uh, based on the gear that we recover on closed days. The bullet side of the buoy needs to be down facing your pot. If you have the buoy attached this way with the flat side down, that is going to cause extra drag. That is going to catch kelp and debris, and that is going to result in gear loss. If you have multiple buoys attached side by side, like let's say you have two attached together to one line, that is also increased drag. That is also increased uh, potential for uh, snagging on kelp and debris and will result in gear loss. Always put the bullet end of the buoy facing the trap. What we see on some of the, the staff setups is these buoys are upside down. So the flat side is facing the trap and that is not what you want. If you, if you have any setups like that, switch it so that the round end, the bullet end of the buoy is pointing down to your trap. Um, one other thing that is a good practice, and in this case, somebody just wrote the length of the line on a piece of flagging attached to this buoy line. It's easy to forget how long your lines are, and there are a number of ways that you can, you know, label your lines. Here's another way. I know this line is 90 feet. It's just got something sewn right into the, the line itself. And uh, it's unambiguous and you won't be setting a pot uh, with what you think is a 90 foot line and it ends up being 60 feet. Um, a lot of recreational traps will have a harness like this so that it keeps the trap level uh, as you're pulling it to the surface. Uh, it's, it's a good idea. Just be, be, uh, be sure your harnesses have durable connection points. This one has stainless steel carbiners um, that attach to the pot. I've seen some that are like plastic hooks. They're less durable and in sunlight they will, they will fail. <laughs> quite frankly. And so uh, I'm not gonna uh, uh, be the person selling you the harnesses here by certain people, but this particular harness is more durable than some of the others I've seen. Um, so to go quickly over the components of the recreational trap that you saw in the diagram, this ring right here is called the escape ring. There are two required on this pot. There's one here and there's one on the other side. Minimum diameter, inside diameter of four and a quarter inches. This allows most of the sublegal males and females to get, come and go through in this pot. Uh, so you're really selecting for legal size males. This pot design also has a bait container built right into the center. That's a good design because it just forces the crab uh, to enter the pot to feed. You don't want to locate your bait out on the edges. Uh, you want it to be in the center, bottom of the pot, and, and force them to come in the gates, which are here. These are swinging gates, which will one-way gates that allow the crab to come in, to come into the bait container in the middle to feed. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what you want. You want to make sure that all of your gates, however many you have on your style of trap, in this case there's four, that they swing freely. And when I mentioned that uh, one possible addition to some designs to add weight to these gates is put like some uh, spiral lead weight on these and that will, uh, that will prevent crab from escaping in the strong current that blows one of the gates open. Uh, that, that is a possible addition to your trap. Uh, the other important thing on this trap is it has some weight already added and I'll tip it up to show you. These are metal bars that are sold uh, for weighting crab traps or for other hardware purposes. You can take standard zip ties or stainless steel wire and you can attach 
to something like this, these weights to the bottom of your trap, make sure they don't interfere with the swinging of the doors so the, the crabs still come in and out of the trap. And yet that adds weight to this pot so it will uh, stay put in a strong current. Um, uh, let's see. Some of the other features of this trap, the biodegradable device. I will tip it up here to show you. This is the, the main door for the trap here. This is the strap which closes that door and the hook. The biodegradable device is this loop of cord here. If this fails, then theoretically, this door will be free to open. And one of the trap designs that Jason uh, and others at the Northwest Straits have found is a concern is this door does not easily push up. And so if you really wanna maximize the escapement of crab, if this trap is, trap is lost, uh, you should put a little bungee here to lift this door up when this escape cord fails. And that will maximize crabs being able to escape this pot if it is lost. Again, this is an oct octagonal style trap. It's a common one, but not as common as the a square folding trap. I'm going to show you a few other things. I'm going to set this one down. A few, few other things about the buoys. Somebody asked about personalizing your buoys. Here is a, a one buoy set up for crabbing that's set up with a halibut clip. This is to quickly attach your buoy. Hal halibut clips just clip onto lines or loops. And that way you can attach this buoy set up to your line. Again, half red and half white. The buoy, the bullet end of the buoy is facing down toward the trap in this setup. You would have to have your full name and address somewhere here where it's visible and legible. And if you wanted to personalize this setup, you could have a different style or color or message on your flag. I've seen some creative ones, let's put it that way. Um, and this PVC tube can have different colors of tape in different series to uh, indicate that, that it's your gear and not one of the many other people out there on the water. That's just one example. If you don't want to use the buoys, here's the single buoy setup with a, a short staff. The staffs make it easy to come by and, and lift the, the trap out of the water. Again, with the halibut clip, you'd have to have your full name and address legible on that setup. Some notes on bait containers. I want to go over that. Again, I showed you a trap that had bait container built in. There are other styles. Probably the most common are the Scotty jars, the plastic jars that you can fill with your bait of choice. And they typically hang in the trap with a little wire set up like this. You run it through the lid and hang it in the center of the trap. There are other, these are, are particularly durable until the sunlight eventually degrades the plastic. Other styles and are, are bigger cages like this. And again, you can fill the cage with something substantial like salmon frames, clams, if they're large enough, and then secure it. Uh, red rock crab are particularly brutal on, on anything that's not durable. So this is a one of the more durable bait options. Again, you'd secure this to the center of your trap. Some of the less durable options for bait containers are like these mesh bags. The good thing is they let fragments of the bait leak out into the water column uh, and the trap draw the crabs in. The bad thing is these aren't very durable. Red rock crab will rip holes through these and eventually, you know, cart out what was inside. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, in terms of weights, 
what can be used for weight? There are, if you're, if you're done exercising and you don't wanna throw your, your weights or put them on Craigslist, these are the kinds of weights we're finding in people's pots. And these actually have a, a coating on them so they won't uh, you know, get rust all over your trap or all over your boat. And like I said, at least it's putting them to good use if you're not using them for exercise. Uh, some other weights that we find are things like this from weight sets tied into people's traps. I don't have an example, but there are uh, bricks that have holes in them that people can sometimes secure into traps. And as uh, Daniel and Jason mentioned, uh, rebar is also a common one. Um, to show you something on the, the skate cord or rock cord piece. Thread size 120 cord usually comes in three strands. So this is an example of the three stranded cord. And if you want to uh, downsize your cord for your sport fishing, sorry about that. It's like my battery's running low want to downsize your cord for sport fishing, you can separate the strands and only use the thinner strand for your sport fishing. Jason, I'm going to quickly have to plug in a cord here in just a moment. Okay. Um, while you're doing that, I say, so you got those three strands of 120, so you get it down to, to 40 thread count. Um, and so we mentioned that 120 can be 105 to 106 days to degrade. Once you get it down to that 40 thread count strand, um, research showed that it takes 67 days. So you're kind of, you're, you're pretty close about cutting, cutting it in half or how long that would take to degrade if you lost a crab pot. So it really helps out to do that. Thanks for your patience. Give me just a moment. Jason, I'm seeing a lot of questions regarding uh, if you need buoys uh, with names and addresses attached, if okay. you're deploying from a pier. And to answer the, those questions, um, simply it's it's yes. The, the rules are, are written so that any pot that is unintended must have uh, a buoy with the owner's name and address marked on it. Um, and that's to track uh, the number of units that that people are fishing with uh, and it was also an attempt i believe to keep the rules simple by not adding other conditions good point daniel um i'm sorry you're probably seeing a notice <laughs> on my screen okay the last pot i wanted to show you was a commercial style pot it's a bit heavier and a bit clunkier. It'll probably break my table. There it is. So what you'll see is this is a commonly used commercial crab pot. Um, the coastal pots are very heavy as Daniel might attest. I think the ones in Puget Sound are a little lighter. They're typically round with three or four tunnels uh, entrances for the crab to get in. The other distinguishing feature about these, is they typically have a ramp coming up into the tunnels and to the gate. The ramp is an interesting feature because both on recreational commercial style pots, it, it helps retain the crab once they come inside you don't have crab that easily get out as another crab's coming in the gate. Typically, most of the commercial pots have a top door, and typically that's where the escape cord is employed, right here on the strap, and they put it right here on the hook. So when that rock cord fails, then this door will pop open slightly and allow the crab to escape. Uh, the buoy setups are similar to recreational. You have sinking crab line. It's often quite common for commercial setups to just have one or two larger buoys, not red and white. They'll typically have 
a four digit number maybe on the buoy or something to identify the commercial fisher and in Puget Sound, all of our fishers are required to have buoy tags and they're typically numbered so that uh, our enforcement can tell which license is fishing and how many units of gear they have out. Um, I'm not aware of any commercial crabber that uses sinking crab line. Uh, it's usually all the leaded sink, uh, uh, I'm, commercial crabbers don't use floating crab line. All of it is the sinking or leaded line. Uh, and again, their labeling requirements are very different uh, from recreational traps. Yeah. And on that pot that, that Don's showcasing there, you'll notice that tag on the end is, is oval. All of the state commercial Puget Sound pots are oval. On the Washington coast, they're gonna be uh, square or a diamond shape. And for an Oregon commercial pot, they'll be uh, the shape of a, a cow tag. So uh, round, but with a, a flat bottom. Um, and that, that's uh, one way that uh, we as fishery managers are, are tracking where that, that gear ends up if it gets lost. And a lot of Puget, you know, a, a fair portion of, of lost gear out of Puget Sound is, is not getting lost because, uh, you know, they lost track of, of where the pot was or it had not enough line or anything. It ends up getting caught on like the bridle of a tug or, or something like that getting pulled out. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing I, I'll note here is, some of the other features of this commercial pot. They still have the escape rings in the upper half of the pot, four and a quarter inch, uh, uh, just like the recreational pots. And it's often very common to see uh, zincs incorporated into the pot. There's some in the bottom here that are hard to see in the video, but uh, uh, that just, uh, according to the commercial crab fishers, uh, 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 maintains the life of the pot and the structure of the pot, and it may alleviate some of the electronic uh, 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 concerns that uh, Jason mentioned earlier. Uh, Jason, is there any other features you would like me to point out with the pots I have here? I, I do have one example of a ring net too that I'll talk about. Um, no, I think I think you've done a great job on all that, Don. Um, okay. Yeah, we got a lot of good questions for you here when you're ready. Yeah, the last one is the, the recreational ring net, and I'll, I'll hold that up here. But basically, ring nets and star traps function differently and have different uh, regulations uh, in, under Washington law. This is a ring net. It's basically two weighted hoops. And you'll notice that the mesh is not necessarily an inch and a half on the sides of this. They typically have a, a little bridle. When they sit on the bottom, they just lay flat. And that, so the crabs can come and go freely. And the only time that you really capture crab is when you pull up on this bridle and makes this net. Um, because this is a, a ring net, it's not required to have the, the escape cord device. And it's not required to have uh, four and a quarter inch escape rings. Uh, so I just wanted to show you, this is a very common piece of gear used from peers and uh, has different requirements than a crab pot. Yeah, one of the distinguishing requirements of the, the ring net is that it does have to lay flat uh, when it hits the bottom. There are models out there that look like a, a ring and don't have escape gear or uh, escape rings or that like that, anything like that, but they have sides that stick up and you know are, are relatively rigid. And that, that by our rules would not be a, a ring net. And it would be required to have those escape rings, even though it's open on top all of the time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the definition of a, a ring net or a star trap, it has to lie completely flat on the bottom when it's being fished. And I, I guess I'm open for questions. Okay, that's awesome. Let me, uh, let me get us back to gallery view. And if Daniel, if you don't mind sharing your screen, I'll share mine as well. Okay, um, so we've obviously run over a bit here because it's been a lot of good information and we have a lot of good questions to get through here. Um, we can, so we'll get through what we can here for the listeners. Um, let's start off. So the first one says, uh, what about small trailer buoys after the red and white one? Um, and I'll also 
jump back to that conversation we were having, I looked up the Washington Administrative Code in the state legislator, um, which reads, I uh, have it right here, it says, as you were saying, Don, um, all buoys, it uh, says all buoys attached to crab gear must be half red or half fluorescent red in color and half white in color. Flags and staff, if attached, may be any color. So that's, that's, that seems pretty, pretty definitive on what you're saying, that all the buoys need to be red and white to me. So by that interpretation, you're definitely allowed to use those trailer buoys, but they have to be half red and white. Yeah, that's that's the way I read that. Okay. Uh, now, in, in practice, I, I have seen setups uh, on the water that have like white trailer buoys or net floats in addition. Uh, I would I would look carefully at, at that um, primarily because, you know, the more buoys you add, the more chances to entangle, I guess. Uh, and, and there are there are valid uh, instances for using trailer buoys and in, in strong currents. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's another area to catch on debris and and just so that the everyone knows even commercial pots you know, 70 pound pots that catch on a floating log will move. <laughs> so uh, on that note, Don, do you have any guidelines for how much weight and scope people should use for setting pots? Yeah, I, I think our sport pamphlet says about two thirds of the, of the water depth should be, uh, I mean, you're, you should allow for an extra third of your line at, for scope. Uh, so uh, the water depth should be about two thirds of your line length. Yeah. Um, weight, it's, it's really site specific. Uh, if you are crabbing at Nisqually Reach, which is closed right now, so this might be just a hypothetical, but uh, at that location, currents are wicked. Uh, and I wouldn't crab there without a commercial style round heavy pot myself. Uh, in areas like Port Susan, uh, that might not be the gear of choice, and you might not have to weight your pot quite as much. So mm -hmm. it is somewhat location specific. One other note that I would I would suggest to people is don't overdo the diameter of your crab line. I've seen some ridiculously thick uh, crab lines being used, and and that crab line acts as a sail in a current. So the, the bigger the diameter of the line, the more drag in a current. And if you're attaching that line to a Danielson folding style pot, it's gonna move. So go with you know, 5 sixteenths. You can even use a quarter inch sinking crab line for most recreational pots. Excellent, thank you. Um, so how, of the gear you're showing, how much of the, of the you can answer this, but how much of the gear you're showing actually comes with the crab pot when you're buying it? <laughs> yeah, again, it depends on, <laughs> on where you go. I, and anyone who's been to Costco probably buys the two pack of folding crab pots and it comes with the buoys. Uh, sometimes uh, I've seen, I guess, situations like that. Uh, the line comes with it, but it's not always sinking crab line. Um, and, and so, yeah, again, if I were going to get my gear uh, and it, it was coming with floating crab line, I would probably buy it somewhere else and just get sinking crab line. Yeah, um, you know, that's, that's a big thing we see with, with a lot of beginners who are getting, in, get in, getting into crabbing. You know, as, you, as Don said, you can go to your box stores and you can get an entire setup. You can get a crab pot, a line, and a buoy, but that doesn't mean you're ready to go. Um, usually those, usually those crab pots are what Don was talking about earlier, those foldable, foldable, uh, sorry, those like square collapsible ones that don't have any weight in them. So they're really lightweight. And the line you got, just because of that line you have, we've got to make sure you have a longer line that he said. So just because you had that, it doesn't mean your line's long enough. Hopefully it's weighted line, make sure it's weighted line, but also it's probably a lightweight pot. So make sure you add weight to it. So, you know, just because you have that, there's other stuff you need to do, um, which we, Don has been explaining very well. And, 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 and unfortunately, the buoy thing, I hate to go back to that. The buoy thing is real important. Some of the people are buying their setups with the buoy upside down. Uh, and we're trying to communicate to those people that make the gear. If you're assembling those setups with pull, staffs and everything, and that buoy's upside down, you're just, you're just creating a problem. Uh, you need to have that bullet end facing the pot. 
Um, how much weight can be put on the trap door before the door becomes too heavy for a crab to open it up? To like be able to get into the pot? <laughs> That's a good question. Daniel, you want to take that one or should I? You don't need a lot of weight to keep those tines of the, the gate uh, down. Just, you know, a, a little piece of lead that you'd attach, snap onto a piece of fishing line. That's more than enough. Uh, if they all articulate as a unit, all you need is one. If they move independently, um, I might add two, mm -hmm. but uh, not, not necessarily. I mean, if one of them's down, it will likely reduce what can get out or at least keep all the legal sized ones in. Yeah, I think some... Some manufacturers actually have like clip clamp on weights for the gates that you can just pinch on with a pair of pliers. Yeah. And, you know, they're small. 20 grams, something yeah. like that. Not much at all. Yeah. Um, are members of the public able to buy crab pots that have been recovered by Department of Fish and Wildlife? Oh, we get that question a lot. Um, we, we donate any gear that's in good shape and keep in mind a lot of the gear we recover is not <laughs> in good shape uh, to a couple of nonprofits, inclu including Jefferson County Search and Rescue, uh, Salmon for Soldiers, and I believe we also do something with the Whidbey or Oak Harbor Power Squadron. And, and those, those nonprofits will uh, hold auctions of that gear off and that's, that's where the public can access and and get some of that gear. Uh, but you know, the, the gear that's not in good shape uh, basically gets recycled. A dumpster worth every year now. Yeah, and I would say it's here at the Northwest Straits Foundation, we do the same, we do a lot of gear recovery. So we do the stuff that doesn't have buoys on the service, we dive for gear and we do the same thing, the usable gear uh, we donate. Uh, we try to uh, promote it on our Facebook page when these other nonprofits are doing fundraisers. We donate to Jefferson Search and Rescue as well. They just had a fundraiser um, last week and then we promote it. So we, we do the same thing. Yeah. And uh, honestly, uh, that's an important thing that we didn't cover in the main part of the presentation is that not only is WDFW getting the stuff with buoys on the surface, Northwest Straits and Natural Resource Consultants uh, are working on getting the stuff that for whatever reason, doesn't have a buoy on the surface. Did you have something to add to that, Daniel? I cut you off there. I was going to say, uh, WDFW does not profit from the gear that we recover from you. As, as Don noted, we donate anything that's usable. Uh, those avenues that, that he mentioned, they don't have the capacity to accept all of the gear that we get, usable or not. So anything that that we can't give away, it's getting recycled. Um, so if, if you have uh, an organization that might be interested in, in you know, using that gear, um, we, we may be willing to partner with you to, you know, pass it off, but we can't sell it and we can't give yeah. it, give it to the general public. It has to go to a, to an organization. That's, that's same here. We, we look for, we look for organizations for our gear too. So same here, if you, you're involved in an organization, you can reach out to us, you know, we're a nonprofit as well, but there's just something that doesn't seem right about pulling gear, then having somebody else's gear, and then we do something with it. So we, we donate it as well. So yeah, we're happy to partner with, with any other organizations too. Mm -hmm. um, so can recreational crabbers use commercial pots as long as they follow all the recreational rules? Yes. Uh, there, uh, again, there are instances where I would go to the commercial style pot just by virtue of the conditions that that site and its quality comes to mind. Um, so it's not very commonly done to be quite honest because they're much more expensive. Uh, you can get a cheap folding crab trap for <laughs> 25 bucks, but if you're getting the three tunnel trilogy pot that commercial guys use, that's 157 bucks for the pot without any buoy or line. Uh, so, yeah, and, and then you have the weight issue. Uh, the typical recreational boat is not geared uh, to pull that commercial style pot. I don't care how many strong teenagers you have on board, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, the, the, there's a pretty significant weight difference even between the commercial style pots uh, that are used in Puget Sound and those on the coast. Uh, and I would, I'd, I'd be leery of using, you know, a, a little crab david on a, 18 foot boat to, to pull that up one, it might break the davit and 
too. You might flip your boat. Um, you're, you're certainly allowed to. And our commercial fleet, when they're not, uh, when the commercial season isn't open, you know, they'll do some some spot fishing as recreational fishermen, following all of the recreational rules with their commercial gear. Mm -hmm. Two per person. I think, I think that pretty much answered this question. I'll say uh, Craig was asking, is it legal for recreational crabbers to use any of the three types of traps? So I'm assuming um, by that, I'm assuming he's taking commercial, recreational, and the rings. Yeah. Uh, like yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, the two units of gear refers to whether it's a ring net, commercial pot, recreational pot, uh, castable device. Those all count as a unit of gear. Uh, and in in uh, when you're fishing for crab without any of those, either by wading or snorkeling or diving, you then become the unit of gear. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess so. Uh, you can you can harvest by hand. The the other important rule uh, that describes the methods that are allowed: uh, you can't you can't use any method which punctures the shell because. For obvious reasons, you know, hey, mm -hmm. I thought it was legal, but I just punctured the shell and it was, you know, a quarter inch undersized. Oops. No, no, no spear crabbing. No spear crabbing. Can you use a motorized device to pull up your crab pots? Absolutely. Yes. yes. That's a preferred method, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, here's one I've had on the back burner, I'll say for you. Um, Day Bob Bay has been severely slow slash dead the last three years. I have been told it's the water temperature and or oxygen pushed into the water from the local streams, which are near drought conditions due to low snowpack. Can you shed any light on the situation? Uh, Daniel, do you wanna go first or do you want me? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so Hood Canal, just like anywhere in, in Puget Sound, there's some you know, cyclicity, there's, there's cycles to the abundance of crab. The, total amount goes up and it goes down, you know, over kind of a time frame of five or seven years. Right now, we're either at the bottom of a downswing, you know, looking back historically, we're at the bottom of a downswing, um, and, and hopefully we'll be moving into an upswing pretty, pretty soon. And those, those cycles are driven by a whole bunch of different conditions, um, including things like El Nino and La Nina and uh, water quality, uh, you know the crab recruitment patterns. You know when when they when they had a really good year where lots of larvae went out uh, and came back and then grew up and didn't have lots of predation. Those will all drive those long-term cycles in abundance. Um, the the factors that the person asking this question mentioned. You know water quality driven by low snowpack or dissolved low DO. Low DO um, they certainly may uh, influence very local crabbing conditions, uh, particularly DO. I don't know so much about uh, stream, stream flow influencing crab abundance in any you know, meaningful way. Um, but I think that just the, the takeaway is that, that crab, the, the amount of crab vary in the environment over time. I think Don probably has something to add there. Yeah, uh, my comments are more on surface water temperature and you know, Steve Sulkin at Shannon Point and Rain Lab has done some research on, on that particular piece and how it might impact recruitment of Dungeness nest crab and red rock crab. Uh, and above about 18 degrees Celsius, if you have your surface water uh, in that range in, during the summertime, that seems to negatively impact Dungeness crab. And that, that situation is actually fairly common in South Hood Canal. So I sort of spotlight that. Uh, red rock crab are a little more tolerant of those higher water temperatures at the surface, but Dungeness crab don't appear to be. So even with yeah. all the other things Daniel mentioned, uh, yeah, you can't ignore the water temperature in the summertime, which is quite high, like in places like South Hood Canal. Yeah, um, one thing that we think is driving kind of recruitment in South Hood Canal and in Green Area 11 and, and 13 is that there, the oceanography within Puget Sound is really complex. And in some areas you have barriers like 
you know, the Hook Canal Bridge or other structures either you know, on the top of the water and intruding down into it, which might limit some circulation of those, those waters, which in turn would limit the dispersal of, of crab larvae further into the canal. Um, we have relatively limited information about that at the time, but it's certainly an area that we as managers are looking or are interested in looking into more. Um, and it's an area of active interest. Uh, with respect to temperature influencing crab growth uh, and larva, I mean, that can happen across the crab's lifespan. Uh, as crab come in as little larvae, they'll be more able to be perturbed by high temperatures and maybe not do so well. Uh, and if that temperature goes uh, relatively deep that can impact uh, juvenile or adult crabs, particularly when they are sheltering on the the, uh, the intertidal benches as kind of one or two year olds, um, and that that might you know play a role in in Daybaw Bay there. Uh, and uh, in addition, in in Puget Sound, it it doesn't seem like crab move a whole lot, so they'll recruit and they'll stay pretty close to where they recruit to, so they'll turn out of a swimming larva um, and grow pop out legs and drop to the bottom and then they won't go particularly far from that location. On the coast, however, that's, that's not the case. We see crab move pretty far over a short period of time. And we think part of that is that there's a lot more food for crab here in Puget Sound uh, that's pretty close by and they don't have to travel as far as they do on the coast. Hmm. And because of that, even if you get good recruitment in a place like off Whidbey Island or Everett, that doesn't mean that that crab's going to walk all the way down into Marine Area 13 uh, or into Hood Canal, where that might have been something we would have expected if we just looked at, uh, you know, what we see with coastal crab. Yeah, and the other thing about the coastal situation is you frequently have a unidirectional current over a broad span of the coast. And so even if the crab... Uh, wasn't doing much just it was it'll be getting pushed a certain direction and so uh, that's not as much the case in Puget Sound the current seem to oscillate back and forth. Thanks okay I uh, do want to wrap this up but there is one more question that I think is important to make sure people stay legal and don't get ticketed out there. Uh, <laughs> do, I, do I have to put my address on a buoy if the owner of the traps is with me? If you're using more than two units of gear your name needs to be on, or if the boat is using more than two units of gear, each person is only allowed two units of gear. So the names need to be changed to reflect that. Yes, uh, that's, that's the only way our enforcement has an ability to verify that you're using the, the two units of gear limit. Okay, and one more le uh, legality question. Can you please confirm that the hoop nets with three rings and slightly raised sides is illegal in Washington. I, I believe that she is speaking to uh, the ring net that I described that does not lie flat when it's on the bottom, where it, no. it has. I think she's talking about a ring pot, and it's it's got a the three rings are almost all the same size. Tell me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. So it has a ring on the bottom, some vertical frame a ring on the top and then a ring with some netting that slides up and down and makes a complete uh, cylinder when it's pulled, only when it's pulled. That's, uh, called a, that's called a ring pot, but it's still a pot. She said, uh, she, uh, Elizabeth responded, you are correct. That's what she's talking about. Yeah, it's still a pot. So because it doesn't lie flat on the bottom with being while well, being fished, it has to have all the features required of crab pots. And it might sound silly, but that includes escape rings, biodegradable device, the whole thing. Even though so it whole, functions quite the different. The whole open area wouldn't be a, one giant escape ring, escape hatch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could argue that, I guess. But uh, uh, that that's one of those designs that's particularly problematic uh, with the current state regulation. I know what she's talking about. Oh, this is a quick, thank you whoever just put this question. They put this up and I, and I lost it. If you eat crab on your boat, do you need to retain the shells? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
You eat crab on your boat. Do you need to retain the shells? Uh, with what I know of current Washington state rules, you are still in the field. And as a result, you are still required to keep those shells. Uh, I, I may have to do some more research into that particular instance. But that's a good okay. question. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you can give a clarifying answer to that, I can. I have everybody's contact here and I'll, I'll email a follow up anyway. So I can add that into the follow up email to everybody that was on here. Yeah. I have a few enforcement officers that I will pose that. Yeah. <laughs> well, as a point of clarification, regardless of whether you keep the, you have to keep the, the back of the shell or not, that crab does need to go on your CRC. Yes, yes, exactly. Excellent, well, I think we're good. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. You know, we're at 7.45 now. We still have over 70 participants. We just had 100 just uh, not too long ago. So it was obviously a lot of good information that people enjoy because they, they stayed on pretty late for it. Uh, it's hard to do on a day like this, uh, <laughs> especially now that it's cooled down for us. And you've got, you've got a lot of thank yous and stuff in here. So thank, thanks a ton, um, Daniel and Don, for taking your time and doing this. Uh, once, a, once again, I think it was really successful. Um, we really appreciate it. And it's, it's exciting because we get how perfect that it works out. We just schedule this and then crab season opens tomorrow because we didn't know that when we did this. <laughs> yeah, you didn't actually. So uh, again, uh, if, if uh, there are additional questions we didn't get to, and Jason, if you're able to pass them along to us, I'm sure it'll be a a fun exercise for Daniel and I to uh, do a little research and, and get back on some of those that we didn't answer. Okay, excellent. And everybody out there, um, once again, thank you so much for, for tuning in. Thanks for your time and best of luck. Should be fun. Happy crabbing. All right. Thanks, thanks guys. <laughs>